Hello and welcome back to RC Model Reviews today. Bling. No, not a multi-rotor as such, but I'm going to look at a flight controller because it doesn't matter what sort of multi-rotor you've got, whether it's one of these, this is a Hobby King 450 DJI flame wheel knockoff thing. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's something pretty basic like this or it's really high tech stuff like your uh, aerial video setups or even the little mini quads that are so popular these days. It doesn't matter what kind of quad you've got or tricopter or hexacopter or octocopter. You're going to need something pretty important called the flight controller. The flight controller is the brains, it's the electronics, it's the guts that basically enables this collection of disparate parts to stay in one place nice and stable or move around under your control. So today the flight controller I'm going to look at is not the quite popular and common NASA. I mean these are probably one of the most popular flight controllers, little NASA. Got a review of this coming up later. And it's not the KK2 board, which is probably one of the most popular boards also at a do-it-yourself level. When people want to build their own multi-rotors, they throw a KK2 in it because it's so easy to use. It has a little on-screen LCD, on LCD. In fact, this one here, oop, this, this multi-rotor here has the little KK2 board in it. And it works quite satisfactorily, but I think satisfactorily is the key word. It's a $29 um, controller board. What can you expect for 29 bucks? Well, actually, I tell you what, when it comes to the control I'm going to be reviewing today, you can expect a hell of a lot and you'll get it. Okay, so here are those three flight controllers I mentioned. You've got the NASA, which I say has been around a long time, used in the Phantom and all sorts of other things. This is a NASA light system. These, I think, about 70 bucks. 70 bucks for that. It comes in a nice little hard plastic case, red and white. The red doesn't show the blood, which is really good. And uh, robust, solid. Uh, uh, some people say, they don't like the NASA. In fact, the guy that makes this doesn't like NASA. He's called this the NAS or NASI 32. I wonder why it sounds so similar to that, but it's so different. And of course, there's the KK 2.1 board with its little buttons and its little LCD screen, which is actually a bit of a pain because just recently I had to order some spare screens from Hobby King because they're unreliable. Oh, I've had three of these screens pack up now, so I'll do a video on how to replace the screen on your little KK controller board because that's going to be a common thing. But today, today we're going to look at this, the NASI or NAS32. And here's a close-up shot of this little board which has a lot of stuff going on there. Now this is the uh, the Funfly version and what's the difference? Well, there's another version called the Acro version. Now most people will find the Acro version is just fine. What's the difference? What do you get? What's the difference between the two versions? Well, this one has a little barometric sensor here and it has a little onboard compass. So you can add a GPS and do stuff like return to launch, position hold, uh, altitude hold and all that sort of stuff. If you're just flying a quad for fun, racing like with a 250 quad, you don't need those and you save yourself uh, a lot of money by not buying the one with those. The Acro version doesn't have those, just leaves the little pads bare and it works just as well for you know high speed Acro. We're just hovering around so yeah this is the deluxe version. I would recommend most people get away with the the standard or the, the cut down Acro version. But what have we got? Well this is where it gets exciting because we've got an ARM, a 32-bit ARM processor. That's right, the KK 2.1 board which, which um, I showed you before that has just a crusty old 8-bit processor, but the NAS, NAS, or NAS32 has a 32-bit processor and the, and the performance of that processor really shows in the way that this thing is really locked in solid. It gives you so much connection with the quadcopter. It's, uh, I have to say it is my favourite multi-rotor controller of all the ones I've tried. This one just seems to work so damn well and it works well out of the box. Now with the KK2.1, you know this little board here, just move that over with this board here. It needs this LCD and these buttons because you've got to tune it. I mean, I've yet to find an airframe that you can throw this on and it will just work straight away. You've got to adjust the P and the, and the I values and fart around and it can take a little while to get it dialed in. I've yet to find a frame that hasn't just flown straight out of the box with one of these thrown in with the default PID settings. They seem to be that good. Now, of course, it's not all good, nothing is perfect, and what you'll find is that this may be a little bit daunting, this board, because you'll notice it's got no pins on it. There's no, it's just a board. How do you plug things in? Well, strengths and weaknesses. You've actually got to do some soldering. Well, you can, I think he will solder the things for you, but it costs you extra. But if you buy the basic board, you have to solder connectors on the side for your um, connections to your receiver, and also some pins on here for the connections to your ESCs. And the beauty of the having to do it yourself, of course, is you can use either straight pins 
or 90 degrees. So the, the connectors can either go straight up and down or they can pop out the side, depending on your installation. So you get that flexibility, but you will have to solder them if you don't order them with the pins already soldered on. Um, <clears throat> it's a little thing, but hey, it's, you know, anyone who's got some modest skills with a soldering iron won't find it too hard, hard because the side where you do the soldering has got a solder mask on there so that solder is unlikely to bridge out and nice gold plated contact so the solder flows very easily. I'll do a bit of soldering, I'll show you that a little bit later in this video, how I've soldered those pins on. This also has some wonderful features for someone who uses the FreeSky system because it has built in free support for FreeSky telemetry. Basically you can connect up your flight battery to this and your um, GPS and so forth in this particular deluxe version and it will connect to the telemetry port on your FreeSky receiver and send a whole bunch of information back to your transmitter. That's brilliant, that's excellent. So um, I won't be setting this one up like that but and I haven't actually done it so I'm just believing what they say because plenty of people seem to have done so had no problems at all. So yeah really good. So what do we have to do to turn this board that I've purchased here and I think at the current conversion rates they're about 30 bucks US so they're, they're about the same price as this but they're so much better. But what do we do to convert this into something that we can throw into our multi-rotor and fly? Right we're going to need a soldering iron obviously. Here's my little Heiko FX888. Some solder and these pin headers they're called. These are the little connectors that are going to go on this board. Now as I say there is a choice. You can put vertical pins on this board so the pins will jut out straight out of the board which is the same as the KK2 or when you order it you can request the right angle headers like this. In a mini quad this is really handy because you do, there's not a lot of height around your flight controller so you can bring your uh, ESC leads out of the side which makes it a much lower profile solution keeping everything nicely within the height of the mini quad. But what I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to use vertical pins because this is going in a somewhat different quad and so we can just use the vertical connectors. I'm only going to install enough to do the four servos that are required. You can you install them all at once but I, I'll just, I can always install the other ones later if I need to. So what I have to do here is uh, obviously get my pin headers ready and solder them in place. So here we go and if you haven't done any soldering like this before it might be a bit daunting but you can always practice on some old circuit boards if you need to. Right, that's the ends done. Just make sure it's all sitting straight up and down. It's all good. Now I can solder up the rest. I use these little XT60 sockets here just to provide some balance so the board's sitting level much easier when things are level. And all done. Here we go. Now the other connectors, these are for the leads that go off to your servos. And if you're using CPPM, because this will work with CPPM, you only need three wires. And generally I just solder the wires directly onto the edge of the board. But if you're going to use a receiver that doesn't have CPPM, you've got to run a lead for each of the individual channels. So you want this connector and the associated leads. And Again, soldering this on here just requires getting one pin soldered up first and then you can solder the rest and just use one pin, get it all lined up and then away you go. Might be a bit difficult to see because I need to get my head right in here to do this. See how we go. It's a bit of farting around to be honest. Try and get that centered on the pads so that. Here we go, try that. There we go, that's one pin soldered. Now make sure I get my angle right so that the other pins all line up nicely. In fact, yeah, that's pretty good to start with. So now I can solder up the remainder of those pins. 
Okay, so that's the basic soldering done. You can put these other spots here, obviously, for other connectors, things such as the battery connector, which will then activate an alarm, a buzzer, when the battery gets low, if you set it up to do that. There's GPS connection if you want to run the um, return to launch and other features on there, or the position hold. But I'm just doing the, the four ESC connectors and the servo connectors. That's it for this particular board. And now I'll power it up and we'll show you how the software works. Right, so here we are, we've got the PC or the laptop started. And the software you use to configure this is the thing called the Base Flight Configurator. And there are two versions. There's a standalone version. And I'm going to use the one that works with Google Chrome because that is the one I have been using. And I think it's more aligned with the features of the NAS32 than the standalone version might be. So start up Chrome. This is a really old laptop, trust me. This will take a little while. I shall sing you a tune while it's starting, if you like or whistle or something. Here we go. Right, so we'll go to the apps in the corner there and should bring up a screen which shows us the base flight configurator. As I say, it's really, really slow. Here we go, base flight. So I click on there and hopefully we will see the introductory screen. There it is. Now the angles aren't very good here because I want to get the board in view at the same time. So oh, actually I might just change the angle a little. Okay, I hope you can see that a little bit better now. Go to HD if you can't see what's happening, but this is the basic screen we've got here. It's got the various tabs to perform different operations, and it's got a connect up here. You need to download a driver as well, I think from memory. Can't, actually, I can't remember. There's uh, plenty of stuff online that will tell you how to do this, so don't take this as gospel. If people want a step-by-step -step, uh, video, then I'll do one, but as I say, no point in reinventing the wheel when other people have already documented all this. So what you will need is a USB to micro USB. There's not mini USB, but micro USB. And that plugs straight into the board. You see there's a little um, micro USB connector on the side of the board there. So what we do is we put the board, I'll plug this in. It should automatically connect. The little lights will flash. Look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Bing. There you go. And it says connecting. And it now it says disconnect because we are connected. So I'll try and put this where we can see it. Put that over there so you can see it. There you go. And as I say, now it says disconnect up here because it's, automatically connected to the board and what I, there's a little set of operations here Acceler, uh, sorry calibrate accelerometer we've got a sequence of events to do to set the board up so I'm going to go in there and just click on that there we go lights flash on the board and then before you know it it should all be done and you'll notice on here there is a rectangle now that's actually our little flight controller you see as we twist and turn the flight controller that little box moves to indicate that the accelerometers and gyros are all working perfectly fine. Isn't that clever? That's lovely. So you can see that your board is actually working straight away before you've even put it in a model. Now also this one has a magnetometer on it so we can calibrate the magnetometer if we want to. Um, there's other things you can do. The tabs on this do a whole lot of stuff. Things like PID tuning. That's all your different values and anyone that's used a micro uh, or a controller board for a multi-rotor before knows all about PID. But suffice to say, as I say, I found the default settings perfectly fine for every frame I've tried this controller board and it's absolutely incredible. Um, as we go across here a bit further, there is receiver. Now this enables us to check the outputs from our radio system. Now we don't have a receiver connected to this at the moment, so there's not much happening. Um, further over, there's auxiliary configuration. This is brilliant. It lets you configure various um, functions to the switches on your transmitter without having to fart around too much. Um, again, there are plenty of videos that show you how to do this. I'm not going to show you how to do it, just show you basically what's there. Um, servos, this does some other stuff. Uh, obviously, the standard default doesn't have servos because it's a multi rotor. GPS, if I had um, GPS connected, then we could monitor the results coming out of here. These are the outputs to the motors, so we can do things like calibrate your ESCs through the controller, clever stuff like that. Um, and then we have raw sensor data. So here, as I move the board around, you'll see these graphs will, will shift to indicate that things are changing. Where are we? Hopefully things move. There we go. You can see over here the outputs of the accelerometers changing and gyros and things changing because I'm moving stuff around. It's just a little uh, debugging kind of thing, I suppose. And over here we have something called the CLI, and this is where it starts People start to get a bit anxious and, oh, this is too hard for me, but it's not. The CLI is the command line interface. Command line interface is just a way of talking to the computer directly. It's like the old DOS days when you type in a command and 
the board talks back to you. So I'll try and keep this flat on the board, there we go. Now there's a few things you have to set up with the, to use it. Um, a couple of things I like to change is, normally when you arm the system, it will automatically start the motors at low RPM. I don't like that, I'll, you know, because goodness me, if you accidentally arm it, the motors are going to start up, and even though they won't take your finger off, it'll be a, you know, give you a bit of a fright, you might drop the multi-rotor, and eh, not desired. So I like to turn off that motor arm facility, and um, what else do I do? Well, that's basically all I do to start with. If I'm using CPPM, I need to enable the CPPM function, but on this case, there's no CPPM, so I don't even need to do that. So I could actually just plug this in and use it now, but I'm just gonna change that motor arm function. Right, to turn off the motors, I just type in, it's gonna be really hard, because it's gonna reach around the side of the camera to type, um, where are we, F-E-A, T U R E space M O T O R underscore. Where is it on? It always varies from computer to computer. Stop. S T O P. Now, as I typed that, it came down the came up on the bottom of the screen here. When I hit enter, here we go. It's uh, simply told it to stop the motors when it's armed. Don't leave the motors running when it's armed. Simple enough, there are a whole lot of commands there as you can see. I'll type a command called dump and that will show you all the different options in this particular thing. See, we'll scroll past, way too many things to remember. Documentation's all online, you can find out what to do, but trust me, you're really not gonna have to play with many of these things at all. So don't be too put off by all those commands and things. Not really that important. Wouldn't have to worry about them if I was you. So there we go, that should be basically it. So now I just have to save it and exit. So I shall um, disconnect because it says here that pressing disconnect will automatically send exit to the board, which will make the controller save the changes and restart. So, but actually I'm gonna just type in um, save and see if that works. There you go, saving and rebooting. Ta-da, simple, piece of cake. So there we go. Now I will wait for the lights to stop flashing and I'll just disconnect. Now we'll put it in, an F, in a frame and see what happens. Done. So now we've got our board mounted in this quad frame here and wired it up to the four ESCs and the wires from the board through to the receiver. Now you can see that the uh, NASE comes with this optional connector here which plugs onto those pins we soldered to the side and it goes off to the various channels on your receiver. It's very straightforward, very simple. And uh, what we'll do now is we'll set up the transmitter using the base flight software so that it will enable us to do things like arm it and so forth. Now, sometimes you get away without having to do this, but it really does pay to do it. Now, I've plugged in the board to the computer here through the, using the micro USB cable, as you can see, and it has successfully connected, as you can see because this has gone green up in the top there. And now we can go and do stuff. Now, what I'm going to do, actually, is I'm going to plug in the receiver as well. So this will fire up the rest of it and the radio link. You can hear the beeping going on there. Now we'll go over to this receiver tab here. There we go. And now hopefully the servo inputs, you can see the bars moving on the screen there, indicating that the servo inputs are working, and I can make sure that everything is going okay. So there's our roll, there's our pitch, seems to be fine, here's our left and right. Now, now it's arming actually, so I didn't have to do this, but I've done it anyway. The idea is we want to set all these sub trims to zero for this, so I go into the menu, I'm using the Turnergy system here, Go into the menu and we'll set the sub trims so we get everything to zero. I'll start with the aileron or the roll trim. Wrong way. The zero, center point should be 1500. Whoops, too far. Too much beeping. And you do this for each channel, just make sure you get the center points correct. Or as close to correct as you can get it. There we go, 1500 for that. So now I will do the pitch. Where are we, pitch? That's pretty close. Whoops. I can't actually get it to 1500. 
the resolution of the radio just isn't quite good enough. So there we go, that's close enough, that's 1501, not going to complain about that. And we'll go down to the yaw and try and get that centered as well, which hopefully will be... Ooh. That's near enough as well, let's go to 1501, make it the same as the rest. There we go, that's close enough. And yep, that'll do for the time being. Now we need to set a switch so we can control our modes, see if the gear switch works on any channel. It does, it works on that channel. So now, having set those roughly, uh, it should also set the endpoint so they go to the 2000 level or something like that. I'm not going to bother too much on this because I want to do this video very quickly. As I say, it's all online. Other people have done it. I shouldn't have to, I won't reinvent the wheel. But we'll go over here to um, auxiliary configuration. This is where we can set things up. Now the Naze board has some really, really good things. It has a thing called the horizon mode, which is brilliant. It's a great combination between self-leveling and rate mode. They call uh, the rate mode angle mode. But what I want to do is on the default switch settings, which is this way, I want to have it set up so that it is in the horizon mode. So I'll go down here to horizon. There we go. So when the switch is in that position, we're going to be in horizon mode. When it's in this position, it'll go to the angle mode. There we go. So now we can switch between the two by toggling that switch. It's as simple to do as that, setting it up. Simple as easy. You can see when I throw the switch on the transmitter, that bar moves and whatever box is ticked for that position of that bar, that's the chosen mode. And since the Eternity radios, when they, Eternity radios, when they start up, all the switches have to be up, it will start up in the self-leveling mode, the horizon mode. But I say horizon is really good because it is self-leveling when you release the stick, but if you push the stick right over, it goes into rate mode, and you can actually still do flips, which is brilliant because most self-leveling modes limit you to about 45 degrees of angle on your multi-rotor. The horizon mode on the Naze 32 let you do flips without losing your self-leveling. Excellent. Right, so that seems to be pretty much set up there. I should calibrate the ESCs, but I won't bother here. I'll show you how to do that perhaps in another video if you need to. Suffice to say now, I just need to save this, exit this, and it will save those results. Disconnect. There we go, that should have saved the results. I hope I can check by going back in and connecting and making sure that we are... Oh, didn't save it. Look at that. That's interesting, I better save it then. So there's our, let's go back in here. Um, that's on our default, so we'll make that the, the horizon mode. And we'll go to the other way. Make it our angle mode. It's a bit of a worry, isn't it? Why didn't it save? Oh, I didn't press the save button. <laughs> there you go, see? I get it wrong all the time. Done. Now we have that. And if I disconnect, just to make sure, like so, and I reconnect, it should remember that. So let's go back to, yes, it remembered it this time. What I'll do also is go back to this initial setup and I'll just do the accelerator, because I now have this mounted in the frame and it should all be sitting nice and level, I'll do the accelerometer recalibration again. Yeah, I think I clicked on it, did I? Yeah, there we go. There we go. So now we've got the recalibration. And don't worry about that slight movement in the yaw plane. That's nothing to worry about. It's quite normal. Brilliant. I guess all you can do now is see whether it flies. So there we go. Done and dusted. Didn't take long at all. It's on the frame. And one thing to note, when you're setting up a flight controller like this, or any flight controller, it's very handy if, before you go out and try and fly it, what you do is you hold on to it, and you just give it a bit of throttle, just make sure that the, everything's working the right way. So when you pull down on one arm, it tries to push back and that your controls work the right way. So your yaw, yours correctly, your roll and your pitch all work the correct way. Because otherwise, if the things are not right and some channels need reversing, when you put it on the ground and you start it up, it'll flip. So that's simple. But no, that total time, next to nothing to do that. And um, when Gordon comes, this is uh, his quad, when he comes, because he's mode two and I don't fly mode two, I get him to have a quick fly. And I'm pretty sure this will fly straight out of the box because, and as I say, I've changed none of the tuning, none of the tuning at all. Just turned off the motor um, arm facility so it doesn't spin the motors when you arm it. And yeah, just centered up those uh, sub trims on the transmitter and away you go. Simple as that, piece of cake. 
That's why I like the Naze 32. So I'll do that flight. Uh, if he doesn't come today, then I'll do it in a separate video so that you can see how well it flies straight out of the box. But there you go. As I say, Naze 32, don't be put off by the fact that it um, it's not, doesn't appear as simple as the KK2. And I think the price, I think for the Acro version, which is the one without the compass and barometer, it's about the same as the KK2 board. So, you know, KK2s are fine, but these are just a whole leap forward in terms of performance and response and the functions that they offer. So yeah, they are my number one favorite flight controller at the moment. Got questions? Put them on the bottom of the video. If you've got uh, comments, put them there too. I'll do my best to read all those and answer any other questions, address the comments if necessary. Now, again, uh, probably these boards will sell out because it seems that when I review stuff and I give it a thumbs up, give it a big tick, they sell a lot of them. So hopefully the guy that makes these will be able to keep up with the demand. Although I have sort of plugged these a little bit already because I've been using them now for over a month and I've been loving it. I've had no problems at all. So, yep. Good luck to him. Excellent. Now, just as a matter, an interesting aside, I had a guy come from Australia the other day, bought his mini Blackout Quadrima Cena on my XJet channel, and we set that up for him. It was a knockoff board, and it really didn't perform as well as this at all. Don't know why, didn't look closely, but yeah, the original from abusemark.com or one of their dealers is the way to go. Thanks for watching. See you again soon on RC Model Reviews. Now it's time for me to get back to the bench.